Although I'm going to talk about surgery, I'm really going to try and focus this talk to the patients and audience. There's a lot of doctors and scientists and folk, but this is really for the patients. It's supposed to be about the past, present, and future, but I'm going to ignore the past. I think we need to move, move, move rapidly on. Um, you know the story. You've already heard this from Shahid. I'm going to focus on the proximal biliary tract cancers. We know that the peripheral intrahepatic carcinoma incidence is likely increasing, but this is the area I'm going to focus on, the intrahepatic, the perihilar uh, tumours for now. Um, the difficulty for the surgeons is the complexity of the, the liver anatomy, the assessment of the extent of the tumour, often it's an infiltrative tumour, uh, which isn't seen well on imaging. The physiology of a patient who's jaundiced, who is ill, malnourished at presentation, the technical demands of the surgery, which is often a multi-hour uh, operation, which may require vascular resections, the underlying liver may be damaged as well. The role of additional therapies, but often we have a kind of nihilistic approach, unfortunately, to this uh, disease in, in the West, as you perhaps have heard from the story 20 years ago uh, from Shai earlier on. The absolute contraindications at the moment is metastatic disease. You know, that's the bottom line because ultimately you don't want to put a patient through a futile operation. But also frailty uh, is an issue and patients do need fully assessed, but sometimes, unfortunately, they may not be strong enough or fit enough for, uh, for, for a radical uh, operation. I want to focus on the patient journey here and feed this back to a survey we did as part of Clangicarcinoma UK a few years ago, and it perhaps shows some of the variability that's going on, even in a kind of highly developed um, healthcare system as we have uh, in the NHS. So we received responses from pretty much every uh, centre uh, in, in the country. Now, patients will often present either in a non-specific way or, as we've heard, they become jaundiced. They'll be referred by the GP or present as an emergency to the local hospital. They'll have some basic imaging. They'll have possibly a CT scan. They'll get a diagnosis. And that's at a local hospital. But then some, not all, will be referred to a tertiary hospital for uh, an opinion. Now, if you look at a common cancer like bowel cancer and metastatic disease from bowel cancer, this is a piece of what we did where we looked at decisions from a local hospital tumour board or an MDT in terms of the management of metastatic bowel cancer. And at that local MDT, all these patients with liver-limited disease were deemed to be inoperable. And when we reviewed the images at the specialist team, and we got other people in other hospitals, both in the UK and internationally, to look at that, we found that a lot of these patients were either treatable with curative intent up front or with systemic uh, treatment. And so the MDT and having your case discussed at a tertiary MDT, I think, is a very crucial step. You know, that's where part of the treatment process uh, starts. When we talk about targeted treatments, clinical trials, this is where it's discussed, you know. And this is a, a picture of the, the, the Liverpool uh, MDT. And often there's up to 30 people in there discussing your case. But in a two to three hour MDT, you'd be discussing 40 patients. So the amount of time per individual patient can be a matter of minutes. And that's a life and death decision for you as a patient. Um, and when you look at the individuals who attend the MDT, and this is from the survey, it was interesting to see for a disease which wherein often the treatment is palliative or systemic chemotherapy, um, the number of you know, oncologists in attendance or the palliative care teams in attendance was, was not 100%, which was, which was worth uh, bearing in mind. Now, the MDT is fundamentally a decision-making machine, and the elements of decision-making are assessing the situation, generating a series of options, selecting an option, reviewing the outcome of that. Okay, so this is a a scenario for a patient with a potential cholangiocarcinoma. In terms of the diagnosis, there's a number of um, modalities that we can use to diagnose a patient. And again, when we go back to the survey, there's a wide variability in terms of the types of 
uh, diagnostic test that we, we undertake. The next step is in patient with jaundice, is treating that jaundice. And again, there's a number of treatment options. You can do an ERCP, which is a camera test, to, to go and drain the bile from below, or you can do a PTC, which is a drain directly into the liver. And again, across the UK in the survey, there was a lot of variability in terms of what we did, PTC versus ERCP, and often this was based on uh, local uh, expertise and knowledge. But I think one of the key things and one of the changes we made in Liverpool was to ensure that all these procedures were done in the centre. So the, the best imaging was done at the get-go, the patient was brought in, and the decision in terms of the type of stent, the place which side of the liver to drain, etc., was done within the regional centre rather than the district hospital. And having that super regional MDT involved in that decision was crucial. But when you look at the survey, again, only in a minority of centres was the biliary drainage being done at the centre itself. Often it was done in the district hospitals where there's uh, variable expertise. Uh, then what options we have, we have a number of options and, and again, it all depends on various factors and that could be surgery, it could be palliative treatment, it could be clinical trials and then we can review that option. But how do we decide on which patients to operate on? Because I guess as a patient, that's what you want to know because you've heard from several speakers that surgery is the only uh, chance of cure, but surgery is a double-edged sword really. So how do we decide on this? Um, so the factors that we use when we plan an operation is, is, is it technically resectable? There's a number of liver surgeons I recognize in the room. If you had 10 liver surgeons in a room, you'd get 12 different answers in terms of resectability. Uh, unfortunately, that's that. <laughs> and often that may vary on a, on a monthly basis. So that, that, that is unfortunately human, human nature. Um, it's also, uh, as a surgeon who deals with cancer, there is this concept of surgical oncology. And so it's important to recognize the biology of the disease as well, and to really use that in our decision-making um, uh, algorithms. But the other thing that we perhaps don't like to talk about as much is what is the risks of doing this operation in your hands, in your institution? You can go and hear someone talking about this type of surgery uh, and ask, great, but implementing that in your organization with your team isn't straightforward, and that itself has to be uh, factored in. Now, in terms of resectability, you may have heard of the bismuth classification, and people tend to talk about bismuth 4, which is when the tumour spreads up along both right and left half of the liver, being uh, um, unresectable. Um, there was a slightly different um, classification that was proposed a long time ago, which is based at looking at not just what's happening in the bile duct, but what's happening around the bile duct in terms of the vessels and things like that. Very complex, not really something that we use in, in the clinic setting, um, but there's a nice series of pictures with that paper, uh, which can perhaps allow me to demonstrate. Um, so bismuth four is that, but you can still do an operation by resecting perhaps three quarters of the liver and get a negative margin and be able to do the operation there. Really the only things that are technically irresectable are when you have vascular involvement, whether it be the portal vein or the hepatic artery, which you cannot technically reconstruct. But then there are other options, and obviously Raj will uh, follow on about liver transplantation, uh, and that is perhaps where we're going to in the future. So in terms of the surgical workup, um, one of the big advances really in all aspects of surgery is something called enhanced recovery, and this is pretty much now uh, standard of care. And this is a multi-step process that you as a patient um, may go through. And it's about improving our perioperative assessment of you as an individual, reducing the physiological stress to you of the operation, improving our perioperative uh, management, early mobilization and, and discharge. And there's a number of components to uh, enhanced recovery. Fortunately, the vast majority do not involve uh, the need of a surgeon, it's, the, it's a broader team and our specialist nurses and our physiotherapists and our dietitians, the, the nursing teams, they're, they're, they're crucial to, to delivery of this. 
But when you look at the, the liver literature, the vast majority of these series of enhanced recovery exclude cholangiocarcinoma because it's a difficult type of cancer that you don't want to focus on. You know, it's all around other types of uh, indications for liver resection. When we look at what we do in Liverpool, um, we've introduced uh, a, a step beyond enhanced recovery called prehabilitation, which is trying to get the patient as fit as possible for um, that operation. We do uh, cardiopulmonary exercise testing. We optimize the biliary drainage. We deal with anemia and any other medical comorbidities. Exercise and healthy diet is part of the whole, the whole work up towards uh, that operation. Uh, obviously, if there is insufficient liver um, after the operation, the patient can go into liver failure so we can have techniques to grow the liver. And this is something called portal vein uh, embolization. And this is a way of just growing the liver by blocking the vein that um, uh, supplies blood to the part of the liver that you're planning to remove. So that may be done, say, six weeks before uh, you come in for your operation. So that may be a step that you, you go through. Um, there is interest in using SIRT or radioembolization to try and grow the liver. And it's any one of my colleagues, Derek Mann is from Newcastle, ha sitting down there, uh, has, hi Derek, has uh, plenty of experience uh, in that. Um, interoperative management is crucial. Um, certainly we have a core team in, in Liverpool that deliver this surgery. There are two consultants who exclusively do the operations. We will often have a, a dual consultant anaesthetist as well, or a consultant anaesthetist with a very senior uh, trainee. And it's a very core group who do this and interoperative management is key. And then these patients will go back to our intensive care. Antibiotics are important. We've learned that often these patients are, will have a spillery stent in. Um, they will uh, have a number of bacteria in the bile. And so we give a, a different concoction of antibiotics and for a prolonged period to prevent the sepsis because the main causes of perioperative mortality are related to either liver failure or sepsis. Those are the two kind of big things. Um, so when we look at our experience, we've uh, undertaken over 100 perihilar cholangiocarcinoma resections. Our median length of stay is just under two weeks, and that's almost double what we see for a standard liver resection for other indications. Um, invariably, people get complications from this type of surgery, and unfortunately, people will die uh, as a result of the operation. So, uh, and that is the, the reality of what we face uh, here. Um, but if you can get someone through the operation, then you can give people hopefully a chance. Um, but the chance of cure is dependent on a number of factors. And this was a schematic that was developed between a US center, uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York and uh, the Dutch group in the AMC. And a number of factors were deemed to be prognostic after the resection. And these are the factors there in a, in a systematic review that we subsequently undertook but in addition, there were other additional factors that were of, of significant in terms of prognostic uh, after the surgery. But on the whole, uh, if you can get people through an operation, you can give people a chance of cure. And this is the uh, data from Liverpool, as well as some of the other uh, single and multi-center series that have been published uh, across the globe. Decision making, I think, is uh, difficult because again, you often hear, you know, you want to get to the right surgeon or get to a surgeon, have an operation, that's it. It's not as easy as that. Um, this is, uh, so we've been working with this international perihilar cholangiocarcinoma collaborative. It's a kind of surgical uh, grouping, again, led out of the AMC. Uh, I think ourselves and Leeds have put in uh, data to this. Uh, and they have reviewed uh, 1,600 perihilar cholangiocarcinoma resections in 25 centres. The 90 day mortality is that. I mean, this is, this is the risk. And if you're gonna get on a plane and there was a one in, there's a 14% chance of that plane crashing and you're dying, you'd think twice. And that's what we're asking people to, to look at, you know. Um, and they looked at various factors that predicted outcome, whether it be perioptive death or long-term survival. And this is what we saw. This is unpublished work, but I don't have a, I don't think I've got a, pointer here. In about 
18% of patients that went through the operation really well, with good long-term outcomes, and clearly they were benefited from the operation. But in another 16% of patients, they either died early as a result of the surgery or as a result of cancer occurrence within a year. And you could argue that operation was futile ultimately. And that's the, that's the balance. But the majority, <laughs> it's a nuanced decision that, that has to be made. And as you heard from our CNSs yesterday, I think one of the discussions was about a patient who perhaps was operable, but they chose not to go down the route of surgery. So it's, it's a very difficult decision. It's not, a, not black and white. That's basically what I'm trying to get at. So once you've had your operations, you've recovered from it, we will see you back in clinic, and then we'll follow you up uh, cl clinically by doing biochemical tests, but also scans. And again, there's a lot of variability in the UK in terms of what people do, how frequently people are observed, what scans uh, are done. Uh, why, why do we do this? Well, there is this concept of oligometastatic disease, which is deemed to be a limited form of metastatic disease where intervention can give the chance of cure. And this is uh, uh, an ESTRO URTC uh, consensus statement on oligometastatic disease. And again, Maria Hawkins, who will be talking later on, uh, has expertise in this. And so if you have biliary tract cancer, you've had a curative intent operation and your disease perhaps relapses, then there may be other options beyond just palliative chemotherapy. And when you look at some of the surgical literature, there is some data around re-resection for patients who've had oligometastatic disease for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. There's less evidence around uh, gallbladder or perihilar tumours. But th this is the new s situation. NHS in England is funding ablative radiotherapy for oligometastatic disease, uh, assuming that that occurs six months after your creative intent treatments. That's why I think it's important to follow people up and identify that because you're not going to wait till someone's become jaundiced or end of life before you do a scan. You know, you want to identify this pattern of disease early so you can hopefully uh, uh, treat because that treatment option exists. So kind of wrapping it up, we're going perhaps forward now. So in terms of multimodal treatments, because I think we can, our best results are when we kind of work together Really, uh, I mean, Juan is sitting here and he is an expert at this. So we have a standard care in terms of palliative chemotherapy. I think there's a, probably a typo there. I think uh, the addition of, you know, uh, immunotherapy may become standard of care rather than will. Adjuvant therapy, there's been a number of trials, uh, but obviously Bill Cap uh, was positive. And again, I think John Bridgewater, sorry, John Bridgewater and John Primrose are in the corner there. And they've really led on, on that kind of practice changing uh, study. And we're all currently actively recruiting into the Actica study. And we're hoping to uh, wrap that up hopefully in the next, uh, next year. Um, adjuvant radiotherapy. So this is radiotherapy after the surgery. This was something we were hoping to explore, but I believe it hasn't been funded. And again, we, we're not really looking actively. We'd love to, but it needs money um, at treatment with systemic chemotherapy before, uh, before the surgery. Um, the other thing I just want to briefly uh, mention is that you'll hear a lot about sequencing of cancers, and this has been extensively done uh, in large series, mainly around intrahepatic uh, cholangiocarcinoma. Perihalar cholangiocarcinoma is an area that hasn't been extensively sequenced. Uh, in Liverpool, we've been working on this uh, for a number of years. We have a mechanism of getting tissue from the theatre, fresh tissue, to, to the lab. And certainly when we look at the perihilar cholangiocarcinoma patients in Liverpool, uh, there's a number of mutations either established or brand new uh, that are in this group of patients which are at a higher frequency than previously described. And at least half, if not more, of patients with perihilar cholangiocarcinoma in our centre would have a mutation that could be uh, targeted by a drug in, in the future. And we've also done single cell sequencing, so looking at the whole tumour microenvironment. We did this, again, this was AMMF funded work. We did this about a year and a half ago, I think, at that stage. 
It probably was the first time this had been done ever on a perihalar cardiocarcinoma series, and this has produced a lot of data that our guys are looking uh, at uh, at the moment. Uh, so wrapping up <laughs> the story of the centers of expertise, this is something that I think will be an ongoing discussion. I think this depends on clinical outcomes. When you look at the NHS England commissioning guidelines for HPV services, there's a number of commissioning uh, metrics there, 28 in total, no mention of cholangiocarcinoma in that document whatsoever. But you also need to look at research and innovation. You need to look at education and training. And when you have a mixture of all that, you can perhaps define a center of expertise. And the team is the thing that's around that. So in conclusion, cholangiocarcinoma, as we know, is rare, or perhaps becoming a less common, uh, sorry, a less rare uh, cancer, but aggressive nonetheless. I think radical resection can, in selected patients, achieve long-term uh, cure. Um, the importance of having an MDT approach and getting, making sure that your case is discussed in, in a specialist MDT. Uh, and obviously we need to further research into personalized care. Thank you.